Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I've been coming to these conferences for a good few years now, um, and Brace have supported me at various different stages of my career. So as a PhD student, uh, a postdoc, and also as a junior lecturer, and it's had a profound impact on my ability to, to uh, pursue the research direction that I wanted to. So I'm always hugely grateful to Brace and always pleased to, to come and tell you about my research. So yes, I'm going to tell you about Fastball, which is a dementia diagnosis tool that I've been developing. So let's start with why diagnose, the need for early diagnosis. We face two major problems with diagnosis. The first one is that it occurs too late, potentially up to 20 years too late. Um, so there is a long lead-in process with dementia where proteins build up in the brain but they don't really cause any noticeable change in the way a person thinks or behaves. Now this period can go on for a very long time. Now these proteins are causing a lot of damage, but we aren't able to detect any of the effects of that yet. And we have to wait a very long time before any of our tools are able to positively say that dementia is present. So that's reflected by on this um, schematic by the subjective impairment and mild cognitive impairment stages. These are the first points at which dementia starts to show itself. But that could be 10, 15 years in. We also have a problem that we can't really tell different dementia subtypes apart from each other in the early stages. So Alzheimer's disease can look a lot like Lewy body dementia, can look a lot like vascular dementia, can look a lot like frontotemporal dementia in the very early stages. So where you don't have the sensitivity in the early stages to know what path people are on. So what we really need is a tool that can help us tell years earlier what effects these protein buildups are having and potentially what path people are on. Now, there are lots of different benefits to early diagnosis. Um, first of all, there's a great public appetite for it. So Alzheimer's Research UK asked people a few years ago, would you want to know if you had dementia, if you had no symptoms? So if we could give you a test, and this test doesn't exist yet, but if we could give you a test in your 40s or your 50s that would tell you positively that you were going to get dementia, would you say, yes, I'll have that test? And a surprisingly high proportion of people said yes. So three quarters of respondents said, yes, I would take that test. So people do want to know. London School of Economics did some modelling to work out how much we could save in health and social care costs if we could diagnose earlier, assuming that there was an effective intervention or treatment. And those treatments are starting to emerge. Well, the, the cost savings to the UK per year, for every single year that you could move the dementia diagnosis window earlier was a billion pounds. So we can save an awful lot of money if we're able to diagnose and intervene at an earlier stage. So those are the motivations for improving early diagnosis. So to currently diagnose dementia, we have really two options, two main tools in our toolbox. The first one is called neuropsychological assessment. These are your typical pen and paper tests um, where a trained clinician would work through a series of questions with you that would be designed to probe your memory or your attention or your linguistic skills, all different manners of brain function. The problem with these is that they are insensitive to the first 20 years of the disease. We have to wait so long before your scores on these tests deteriorate to a point that we're confident you have dementia, that by that point, the brain is damaged beyond repair. So they're insensitive. They also require something that psychologists call executive function. Executive function just means, can you understand the task and can you provide a response? Now that seems fairly straightforward, but actually what it does is it opens the door to a whole range of biases, a whole range of reasons that your score might be affected, not by the disease, but by another influence. And these can be things like cultural biases. So for example, if you're trying to complete this test in your second language, naturally that's going to be a harder job than someone trying to complete it in their first language. There are also educational biases. So people that stay in education longer get good at tests. And that skill stays with them their whole life. And so when they come to do these tests, 
they have good strategies for remembering things. They, they're familiar, they're comfortable with doing tests. And so their scores stay high for longer. The disease doesn't care. The disease is damaging their brain like everybody else. But their scores are staying consistently high. So effectively, their education and their intellect is masking the disease. Um, and there are also performance biases. If you put yourself in the position, it's your day today to go and get this test. And the outcome of this test means you either do or do not get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Then think about how anxious that might make you feel. You might be very nervous about the outcome, or you might really, really want to do well on the test. And anxiety can really affect people's performance in different ways. For some people, it can boost their performance. But for many people, it can really adversely affect their performance. So if you're too nervous, maybe you just don't do well on the test that day. So these pen and paper tests have real structural problems. There's also an issue with false positives. One of the most commonly used ones, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, has a false positive rate as high as 40%. This means that people that do not have dementia are routinely scored as if they do. So they're not particularly specific. We also have biomarkers at our disposal. So biomarkers come in lots of different flavors. You can have brain scans, you can have spinal taps, or you can have blood taken. Brain scans are looking for changes in the shape of the brain. They're looking for what we call volume loss in the brain. Now volume loss only occurs once neurons have died. You can't grow new neurons. Um, so if you wait for neurons to die, and you wait for enough of them to die, that your brain changes shape drastically enough that an MRI scan can pick it up, you've waited too long. Spinal taps will take cerebrospinal fluid, and so will, and blood biomarkers can also be used to pick up, take proxy measures of the amount of the different proteins that are present in your brain. So they're a proxy measure of what's going on in your brain. Now these can be useful, but spinal taps are very invasive, and blood biomarkers are not yet sensitive enough to be used routinely clinically. There's also not a great relationship between the outcome of these scores and how well you function cognitively. So there's a weak link between the measure that they give you and how well actually someone is functioning, performing. So some of them are expensive, some of them are invasive, and some of them have limited availability. Blood biomarkers are probably the most promising Thing on the horizon. So they are relatively new, but they probably will be, will form um, an integral part of dementia diagnosis in the future. Um, but what we really need is something that can be partnered up with these structural biomarkers that tell you how, the, what sort of state the brain is in with how well it is functioning. And that's what I've been trying to develop. So I've developed a test called Fastball. It requires you to wear an EEG cap so an EEG cap looks a bit like a swimming cap with a range of sensors on, and this measures your brain waves. What we do while someone's wired up to one of these caps is we ask them to watch an image stream that we present on a computer or on a tablet. Now hopefully this video will play and give you an example of this image stream. So this is a very short task. It takes just a couple of minutes. And the first thing we ask people to do is just passively watch the images that appear on screen. So the walk the water wings, and the jammed heart. They then see a stream of images whilst they're wearing the EEG cap where, these, where the wok, the water wings, and the jammed heart reappear at periodic intervals. They're not asked to do anything. They simply passively watch this image stream. And hopefully what you're seeing is that those, the wok, the water wings, and the jammed heart is popping out and the EEG headset is measuring the brain's response to this pop-out. This pop-out is what psychologists refer to as recognition memory. Recognition memory really needs a particular part of the brain to be working well. It's a part of the brain near the hippocampus, and we know that it fills full of amyloid protein in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. So we designed a test that really relies on this brain area that we know is hit hard in the first stages of Alzheimer's disease. So what we did is we invited patients into our laboratory at Bath, and this was the first, this was the proof of principle study that was funded by BRACE in 2018. 
patients came to the university along with younger um, controls and healthy older adult controls. They put an EEG headset on, and you can see a, a couple of photos of our volunteers with this net with the little sensors on. And they watched that image stream that you just saw. Now, it lasted for a little bit longer than the, the demo version you saw. It lasted for about two minutes, but there was no task. They weren't given any instructions. They didn't provide any response. They simply passively watched the images. And what the results, what the data told us was that the younger and older adults were comparable, so your brain doesn't really change in its response as you get older. But if you get Alzheimer's disease, this response drops right off. So suddenly we have a passive, short task that can capture Alzheimer's disease impairment. And this is the study that was published last year. We're in the middle of a study at the moment where we're moving earlier in the disease process. So rather than looking at Alzheimer's disease, now we're looking at the, pr the, the stage before that called mild cognitive impairment. So this study, we're testing 100 MCI patients. We're testing them initially. We're doing a one-year follow-up, and then we're doing extended clinical status follow-up. So we're going to find out what happens to these patients. For some of them, they will end up being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, but not all. And we're going to see whether our fastball test can predict whether they would or would not go on to later be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. The biggest change, though, in this project is that we're not asking people to come to the lab anymore. Instead, we're taking the EEG headsets to their homes. And this has been a transformative change since I started using this technology in 2009 to now. These EEG systems are now small enough you can fit in a backpack or a laptop bag. So there's no need for patients to come to the labs anymore. And that used to be a huge barrier for us in terms of data collection. Being able to go to patients' homes has doubled our recruitment hit rate for, for testing. And you can see the image on the screen is just showing how small these kits are. So it's a laptop and a, and a small eight-channel EEG system that can be taken to people's homes. And my research assistant, Sophie Oldman, who's here today, travels around the southwest with a rucksack with this kit in and tests people in their homes. So I'm able to share some of the preliminary data from this study. Oh, I'll, I'll just um, tell you what they're doing as well. Um, so they're going to do the, they, they complete the recognition memory version of Fastball, which you saw the demo of earlier. But they're also doing a range of extra tasks. So we're trying to diversify and increase the types of cognitive functions that we can pick up by playing around with different stimuli types. It all follows the same principle that you passively watch an image stream for a couple of minutes where the types of images vary. And we're looking at different forms of cognitive function. So semantic memory, attention, and visual construction. The reason we're doing this is these are all relevant for different dementia subtypes. So recognition memory is going to be really important for Alzheimer's disease, but less so for Lewy body dementia, whereas attention and visual function could be really critical for Lewy body. So they complete a, a task battery this time of a range of different tasks, um, trying to capture different cognitive functions. And what we're, sh what we're seeing is that the fastball responses in MCI patients are correlating with their pen and paper scores of memory. So this is telling us that our two-minute passive task is capturing the same function that maybe a 10 or 15-minute long pen and paper task is capturing. And the really useful thing is that it is specific. So it doesn't correlate with general cognitive performance or any other cognitive functions, it correlates specifically with memory. And that's a really good thing, because if you're developing a new test, you need it to be two things. You need it to be sensitive, but you also need it to be specific. And it seems that our fastball memory task is exactly that. So that's where we're up to today. What comes next? Well, I'm delighted to say that Brace have <coughs> very kindly agreed to further fund this line of research and they are funding Oliver Herman's PhD studentship. So for the next three years, Oliver will be developing and refining these fastball tests for non-Alzheimer's dementia. So trying to build a battery of tests that we could give to people that would be able to tell whether they had not just had Alzheimer's disease, but potentially Lewy body, frontotemporal, or vascular dementia as well. And in the summer, we were also um, awarded one and a half million pounds to put Fastball in Southmead Hospital for the next four and a half years. So we're gonna take these tests, 
We're going to put them onto a commercially available EG platform that's very, very simple to use, so you don't need experienced technicians anymore. And we're going to test over a thousand patients between 2023 and 2027. So everybody that comes through the door will be offered the opportunity to complete one of these tasks. And really, we're asking a simple question. Can we do better than the pen and paper tests? There is also a commercial and technical element to this project. We're not just going to provide data, but we're building towards a viable tool at the end of it. So there are commercial and technological elements to this task. So we need to produce something that the NHS could actually commission in 27 or 20. 28 if it works if the data goes our way we need to have something ready for the nhs not just an academic paper but an actual tool that they can use to do that we have to work with industry and so we're going to work with a medical technology company that already has an eg platform simple enough to use that right now in clinical trials dementia patients take this platform home and they use it themselves unsupervised for repeated at home assessment so we're going to take Fastpool, put it on that platform, and put this in Southlink Hospital and see what we get. We also have a range of other targets in this, in this uh, big project. We're going to do a feasibility study in primary care. So this will involve putting this system into two GP surgeries in North Bristol um, and uh, basically examining what are the barriers to, be, to this test being used in, in primary care. This, is, this part of the project is not a big data collection exercise, it's more about understanding how GP staff would get on with this, how do you fit this into a seven minute GP appointment. We're going to do health economic analysis to work out can we save the NHS any money? We're very confident that we can. The current NHS tariff to administer a neuropsych test, a pen and paper test, is £750, just for a pen and paper test in North Bristol at the moment. So we, all we need to do is be cheaper than that, <laughs> and that's not that challenging. Um, and as I mentioned, there are technical and, and um, regulatory milestones to this project as well. So we're going to engage with the MHRA and to try and get Class 2A medical device status. That means we could use this safely in a, re in a regulated environment um, and with NICE to look at getting uh, NICE guidance and commissioning for this tool. So hopefully what I've been able to convince you of is that we have the proof of principle for this new tool. It's sensitive to Alzheimer's disease. The current data collection suggests it's also sensitive to the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, and that's really important. Um, we've shown that home EG data collection is the way forward. We don't need people to come to labs anymore, and that's going to really make a difference as to how this technology is used in clinic and, and at home. And this new funding provided by BRACE and the other funder will provide the clinical validation and a tool ready for the NHS to use in the future. So I just want to thank um, my team at the University of Bath, Sophie Alderman specifically for uh, the data collection for the data that you've seen today, my collaborators in Bristol, um, and of course the funders and top of that list uh, is no surprise is BRACE. So thank you very much.